Hello and welcome, this is a devlog for my Terraria clone made using Pygame and Python. Today I'll be covering the game's lighting system, structure generation, particle effects, smooth camera and some major backend changes to make the game more stable. On a side note, people have been asking me to explain what I'm doing in my videos a bit clearer. In the past I've used, you know, text-to-speech or plain text, so I bought myself a good microphone from game for around 70 quid, and I think it sounds pretty good, but I guess you'll be the judge of that. Anyway, it's been a while since I developed anything in Python, and going back to code from this project was nothing less than a nightmare. For some reason my programming motto was compact equals cool. It couldn't be further from the truth, a more accurate motto would probably be compact equals confusing. Brace yourselves, because this is an actual snippet of code from the project before I started refactoring it, and I can't easily make out any part of it. I stumbled upon it and I literally had no idea what I was looking at. It's, you know, and I wrote it. <laughs> Why did I ever think this is good programming practice? I guess I just hated white space. And just for comparison, here's what the code, like the same snippet, looks like now, after I've refactored it. It may be double the line count, but you can actually make out what it's doing. I did this kind of cleanup for most of the 5,000 lines in this project, using find and replace whenever I could. But I'm pretty sure my spacebar is about to fall off. I also made minor optimizations, like doing times by 0.5 instead of divide by 2 to save precious CPU cycles. This did come back to haunt me later on when my terrain generation code had all the divide by 20s replaced with times by 0.50. And I couldn't work out why my terrain was looking like this. <laughs> yeah, that was fun. Not to mention that all 5,000 lines of code were just crammed into one file, because apparently I also hated my scroll wheel. So as well as cleaning, I moved all the components out into their own files, and this just improved the readability and ease of access massively, because you just know where everything is, you don't have to scroll. I also took the time to make my tables easier to access by aligning all of the cells, so it's just way easier to access anything and I commented everything, so hopefully if anyone wants to add any items it shouldn't be as hard, because it, it looked so awful before. <laughs> anyway, getting the game to boot again with a complete structure overhaul is what used most of my time, but when things are up and running I could start adding new features, the first of which was a timekeeping variable. One of the main issues before this release was that if the game ran below the target FPS of 80, objects would start to move in slow motion. This is because all movement in the game was constant no matter the time passed between frames. This constant movement was designed to look correct at an FPS of 80, and if the game ran at an FPS higher or lower than this amount, it, time seemed to warp as things would move faster or slower. The solution is a delta time variable. It holds the time passed since the last frame, and is calculated by taking the time in milliseconds at the start of the current frame, minus the time in milliseconds at the start of the last frame, then dividing it by a thousand to get it in seconds, or multiplying it by 0 .0 .0 0.001. Uh, this can then be used to like work out how, uh, how much objects should move in a single frame. The result is consistent movement no matter the hardware the user has. I did cap it so that if the FPS goes below 30 it will still go in slow motion, so that the collisions will still work and not fail, otherwise you just clip straight through the world if you're running at like 10 FPS, but other than that it's pretty good. Here you can kind of see some of those effects I just talked about. In the process of adding this delta time variable, it did mess up all the values I had for velocity in terms of movement and shooting projectiles and anything that needed to be given a velocity was kind of broken because all the values are now obsolete. So there were some pretty weird effects where, like you can see here, these slimes just can't seem to get off the ground, which I thought was quite funny, almost like a fish out of water. And these arrows had like no velocity at all and the gravity was all ruined. Particles like were staying here indefinitely because it, the time was in seconds now as opposed to milliseconds So they were there for like several hundred seconds So yeah, there was a lot of tweaking to be done especially with the particles The next thing I want to touch on is the lighting in the game So the, the last build did have an experimental lighting option in the config file But it was very very broken and not very quick and in this patch I've made a lot of changes to the way it computes things to speed it up a little bit including moving all of the lighting calculations onto a separate thread so they can be done in parallel. It is still limited by the speed that Pygame can draw transparent surfaces to the screen, and uh, it's just very slow because of that, and you can't multi-thread it. Uh, yeah, it's a pain. I mean, I tried, but I'm pretty sure you can't have multiple threads splitting to one surface at the same time. Anyway, the way the actual lighting works is that every light source recalls a recursive flood fill function with the light's intensity as a parameter. The flood fill function essentially cascades this value to its neighbours, reducing the value by 1 every time it recalls itself. And then when the light it's given is less than the light at the tile, it simply returns. A great way to speed this up is to give the initial tile data something more accurate than just zeros. 
so any tile that would give light is set to 15, so uh, anything above ground, and then any block is given a value of zero, so that, that it doesn't have to do as much work in the initial flood fill. I managed to streamline this function so that a single lighting update takes around 90 milliseconds. Being used to C++, this value seems incredibly large, because you can usually get things down a lot quicker than that. But I don't know if this is a limitation of Python or something that I programmed, but it works well enough for the situation. Because the lighting takes so long to update, I frequently had the edges of the light surface being shown when the camera was moving quickly. This is because at the time, the thread generating the light would use the position the camera is at currently, which obviously is changing very rapidly. What it needed to do was predict where the camera would be when the lighting thread finishes its calculations. The way it does this is it gets the effective velocity of the camera by getting the difference from the last two frames, dividing it by delta time to get a velocity, and then multiplying that velocity by the time the, the last thread operation took to finish. So say the last thread took 90 milliseconds, it would say, okay, in 90 milliseconds time, where's the camera going to be? Let's put the light surface there and render it. And this means that now you very rarely see the edges of the uh, surface, unless the camera jolts very quickly, so the last frame is not correct, and therefore it thinks the camera is going to be stationary, but it's actually moved in that frame. And because this is happening pretty frequently, like when you died, the camera would immediately jolt back to the start, and then there'd be no light, and then it would load in. I wanted to kind of solve this problem, so I made the camera also smooth out as well as smoothing in. So it essentially does the same algorithm, but it clips it so that say it's moving at a velocity of 1, the next frame it can't be moving at a velocity of 100, it can only be moving at like double its speed or triple. And then I included delta time so it works with the time step as well. And the result is these nice smooth transitions as the camera accelerates and decelerates and there's no sharp jolts so the lighting knows where to put the next surface and it just looks in general a whole lot better. And because the lighting takes, you know, as I said, around 90 milliseconds, I also had to clamp the speed of it so that it wouldn't go above the speed that would allow, you know, the edges to be shown. I think it's around about 200 blocks a second at the moment is the max. Next I'll cover the structure generation. So with lighting implemented fairly well and everything running back as usual, I wanted to try and make the world a little bit more interesting. So obviously I looked at my source material and saw that Terraria has these massive trees that uh, spawned. I didn't have the height to do that because I've only got about 100 blocks above surface. So I was thinking what I could do and I thought about these kind of mine shafts and I built this little test structure on one of my worlds and then worked on creating a table for that inside the code so that I could, you know, spawn it wherever I wanted to and then duplicate it and whatnot. So the structure generation is pretty simple because it's modular. It essentially just picks a random number of vertical slices to put in. So I think it's like seven, random number between seven and 30. And then any one of these vertical slices can also have either a door on the left or a door on the right or nothing. I think it's about a 10% chance for that to be a door on either side. And then these rooms are pre-built. So it's only got four, or no, five total pieces because there's also a broken bit at the bottom so that it kind of blends a bit more seamlessly when it gets to the bottom of the mine shaft. And then the chests are filled with loot from the loot tables in the, in the tables.py. There's not really much else to say about them. I kind of wanted to do it a little bit more dynamic so that you could define it all in the tables and not have to do much code and then just have it, you know, create these massive structures, like create uh, connections between parts and then have it just pick a random connection. So I might try and do that at some point with more complex stuff like the dungeons in Terraria maybe. But for now, it's a very simple structure. But I think it's pretty effective, like it's it looks pretty cool on the surface, yeah. And if you're wondering, the chest loot is completely dynamic, so you can set like a chance for an item to be found, a required depth for that item, so it needs to be below say 200 blocks or something. Uh, at the moment it's only got two items, because I haven't really worked on that many like graphics and like ideas for items, but I guess that'll be coming soon. So I was thinking like, you know, some kind of grenade that explodes arrows or something, that'd be quite easy to do. I also added a new block for the sort of dungeon things. I added the spike block, which will take five damage off the player or enemy that stands on it. So you can go down into these mine shafts, pick up all the spikes, and then use them to defend your house, or, you know, just die when you go in there and try and get the chest. So it's quite cool. The next thing I want to touch on is the particles. So I want to make them more dynamic than before, because at the moment when you hit a slime, it'll explode in a, a you know, radius around it, but it doesn't have any relation to what you hit it with. So say if you hit it with a sword, it would still explode the same way as if you hit it with an arrow. Whereas now I've kind of got it so that if you hit them with an arrow that's going kind of up left, the particles that spawn will kind of explode in that kind of cone outwards. And I think in general it looks a whole lot better. It's based on the velocity of the 
of the slime and the velocity of the projectile. You can, it's basically you can give it a source and a source velocity, and then it'll use that information to make the particles more dynamic. But yeah, this is present for most things, not just enemies. So when you shoot a block, it will like the particles will fly out in that direction. But yeah, it's quite cool. And that's pretty much all for this patch. I did make a few minor changes, like changing the fall damage, because there were people getting really annoyed that the fall damage was just insanely high. And it was. You would fall like two feet and you would take 30 damage. And I just never bothered to change it, which was quite annoying to some people. I also added like subtle things like the grass grows. So if you have a dirt block that's at surface level, then it's got like kind of a random chance to be turned into grass if it's above, you know, everything else. And uh, yeah, so it looks quite cool. You can see it there. And kind of the worst part of the code was the menu system, so I read all that because it wasn't modular at all. So it was just taking up so much space in the original code because it was just repeating variables that were basically the same thing. So I created a class for that and then instanced it in, a, in its own little manager module. So yeah, that's pretty much all I really wanted to cover. So yeah, thanks for watching. And feel free to download the code and play with it yourself or just play the game. But yeah, thanks. Bye.